Praise the Lord. A reading from the Gospel according to St. John chapter 10, verses 31 to 39. The Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus replied, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these are you going to stone me? Then the Jews answered, It's not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, though only a human being, are making yourself God. Jesus answered, Is it not written in your law? I said, You are gods. If those to whom the word of God came were called gods, and the scripture cannot be annulled, can you say that the one whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world is blaspheming? Because I said, I am God's son. If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works, so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Then they tried to arrest him again, but he escaped from their hands. Dear friends, reflecting on the mystery of the cross, we are asking the question, why was it, historically speaking, that Jesus was crucified? Jesus, a person in whom no sin, no guilt could be found by any, a person who loved everybody and asked everybody to love each other, a person who did not do any harm to anyone. Why was he so brutally treated and crucified? We have seen three reasons, the political, economical, and social reasons, all leading up to a rejection by a dominant class, the leaders of the people. Today we focus on another aspect, that is the religious, and maybe the most important aspect in the historical act of crucifying Jesus. In fact, Jesus was arrested, was put on trial, and condemned to death, first not by the Romans, but by the Jewish leaders. And this they have done with a purpose and with great planning. Why did the Sanhedrin, the official authority of Jewish people, arrest Jesus, condemn him to death? What did he do wrong? That's what we are asking today. And the reason for his death on the religious sphere can be seen in his relation to three aspects. Jesus' relation to the law, Jesus' relation to God, and Jesus' relation to the Jewish leaders. First, his relation, his attitude towards the religious law. We know Judaism or the faith of Israel is very systematically defined and described, regulated by laws. We have the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, the revealed will of God, given through Moses on the Mount Sinai, written on tablets of stone by the finger of God. The revealed will of God, the Ten Commandments. Then there are other laws, subsidiary laws, and altogether we have about 613 laws prescribed in the Bible that regulates and controls the entire spectrum of the day-to-day -day life, and the social life and political life. All spheres of life is controlled and regulated by religious laws. And there were lawyers, experts, the scribes, who reflected on, discussed and interpreted the law applied to practical situations and hundreds and thousands of regulations and interpretations have come into being. So the religious life of the people, or the day-to-day -day life of the people was very systematically defined and controlled by the religious laws. And many of these laws had become so difficult for the people to observe. The most important law was that of the law of Sabbath. We know Sabbath was instituted as a law guaranteeing freedom and rest. I read from the book of Deuteronomy chapter 5 verses 12 and following. We know there are two lists of the Decalogue. One is given in the book of Exodus chapter 20. The other is given in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 5. In the book of Deuteronomy chapter 5, the Sabbath law is given like this, verses 12 and following. Observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. For six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work you or your son or your daughter or your male or female slave or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock or the resident alien in your towns so that your male and female slave 
arrest as well as you. This is the law. The law of Sabbath was given to guarantee arrest to the people who work, be they Israelites or aliens, slaves or freemen. Everybody should have the right to rest at least once a week. So this was a law made purely out of human concern for the rest of the workers. But then later another addition was given to it in the narration of the first account of creation, the first chapter of the book of Genesis, we see that God created heaven and earth in seven, six days and on the seventh day he rested. And to enter into the rest of God or remembering this rest of God and also dedicating one's own lives to God in order to remind God's presence in our lives, people are asked to observe the Sabbath. So the rest of God, as well as the rest of people, combined. Whatever be the motivation, the one thing is sure and clear. The Sabbath law was made for people to rest. And what happened in the course of time, this law has become such a burden because it was forbidden to do any work. And in describing what type of work one is not allowed to do on the Sabbath, they made the law such a burden. People were not allowed to do any type of work and all a lift in the fear of breaking the Sabbath. So when Jesus comes to the, in his public ministry, he made it a point to interpret the law of Sabbath by his own action and showing what the law of Sabbath means. In fact, one of the accusations leveled against him, the first accusations, so to say, was that he does not observe Sabbath. In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2, verses 27 and following, it is said, Jesus, when Jesus defended his disciples who were walking on the Sabbath and plucking grains and eating, Jesus said, The Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. The Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Sabbath is for humanity, for man and for woman. And don't make people a slave of the law. That was the attitude. Religious laws also are meant for the well-being of human beings. And these laws should not become a burden, an enslaving factor. And this becomes much more clear in the next incident. In the Gospel of Mark chapter 3 verses 1 to 6, Mark reports an incident. Again, he entered the synagogue and a man was there who had a withered hand. They watched him to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, Come forward. Then he said to them, Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or kill? But they were silent. He looked around at them with anger. He was grieved at their hardness of heart and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was restored. That was on a Sabbath day. They wanted to trap Jesus, and Jesus knew, and he asked the question, and they did not answer. And that grieved him, and he was angry, or wrath, or gaze, the Greek word used, or gay. That is the wrath of God against the insensitivity of humankind. And then what happens? In Mark 3, 6, the Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him. How to destroy him? Two parties, a religious party and a political party. Pharisees are the staunch observers of the law, a religious congregation, so to say, who have made a vow to observe all the laws and traditions, written or unwritten, scrupulously, literally. So they are the holy people, the saintly religious people, the Pharisees, the Herodians, they are a political party, supporting the monarchy. So a religious party and a political party, religion and politics come together to eliminate Jesus because they consider him a public threat. That is all today at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. His attitude towards the law somehow causes Jesus very dearly. The religious and the politicians come together to do away with him, destroy. So this come, continues in the following ministry of Jesus. The threat was there. So the, his attitude towards the law. I have taken only one example. Then much more serious is his attitude 
towards God. What Jesus said about God, how Jesus spoke about God and how he dealt with God. God was considered holy and is holy. God the transcendent, the most holy God living in heaven. And his presence was somehow covered from the sight of the people and he was supposed to reside in the holy of holies into which only the high priest and only once a year was allowed to enter. The most holy God. People were so much afraid of this name or so much devout. They had an awe about this name of God that they would not pronounce it. When the name was revealed to Moses as Yahweh, I am, this name was not to be pronounced. And people did not even pronounce the word God. Instead, they would say the most high or the power, the glory or something like a circumlocution because it was the great respect towards God. And now here comes a man, a carpenter from Nazareth, by profession a carpenter, without any professional religious education, without any certification from any university or any rabbi. He comes and speaks about God as if God is his father. That's what Jesus did. Whenever he speaks about God, he speaks about Abba. Abba is the word a child uses to address his dad. So this familiarity with which Jesus spoke about God and to God, that was amazing or rather shocking. The familiarity with the holy God. And more than that, not only he addressed God as father, he allowed and encouraged and taught his disciples to call him father. God is the father. God is the father of everybody. He is not to be looked up in heaven. He is here in your midst. He is the one who cares for you. He is the one who sends the rain. And he send, sends the sun on the wicked as well as the saint. Saint and sinner alike. God is the father. So the familiarity with Jesus experienced and expressed with God was really shocking for the people. This somehow is shattering their God concept as if he is either a blasphemer or he is a mad or an atheist, more so. When Jesus started teaching, he had an authority. He taught with authority. And if you read the Gospel of Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount from chapter 5 to 7, we see how Jesus is interpreting the law. He said, I did not come to abolish the law or prophets. I have come to fulfill it. Not a yota, not a dot from this law would pass away until the heaven and earth pass away. That means they are valid permanently. But then when he started teaching, it goes in a different way. I have come not to abolish but to fulfill, he said. And six times he says, it was uh, chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. You have heard that it was said to those of ancient time, you shall not murder. And whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you. It was said, but I say to you. And who is this I? The I that corrects the laws that was given by, Moses, by, by God through Moses. Now here comes a person, I tell you something more. So he is changing, he is subverting the laws given by Moses. So he is something greater than Moses, he is claimed to be. So the teaching, interpreting, reinterpreting the law is already causing concern for the, the leaders who are supposed to defend and safeguard the law and order and the orthodoxy and faith of the people. Jesus comes with a new interpretation of the law and more. And the more is when he does certain actions, say for example, that is reserved only to God. A man with a paralysis was brought to him. The person could not walk and he was carried on a bed by four. And nobody, they could not enter the house, so they made an opening on the roof and let the pallet down. Mark chapter 2, verse 5, we read. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Son, your sins are forgiven. 
Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this fellow speak in this way? It is blasphemy. It is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. So what only God could do, Jesus is doing here. He calls God his daddy as if he is of equal status. He allows and encourages people to call God father, telling you are sons of God. He breaks the laws and interprets the law in his own way. And now he comes to say your sins are forgiven. Nothing is said about the situation of the person who was a a paralytic. And this happens again and again. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, we see a sinner, a public prostitute, who comes to the house of the Pharisee where Jesus was sitting at table. And there he weeps and washes his feet with her tears, wipes the feet with the air, and anoints with costly ointment. And then when he was criticized by the Pharisee, Jesus tells her, your sins are forgiven. Go in peace. Forgiving the sinner. That was one of the constant elements in his life, it would seem. Bringing people back to reconciliation, union with God, the Father. So these were unheard of things. Jesus is doing something that they never expected from any Messiah, any prophet. No prophet would ever do this. So much so, when the trial comes, interestingly, Zephyrily in his film, Jesus of Nazareth, brings an interesting scene where Caiaphas, convening the Sanhedrin, discussing the question of Jesus. Many bring up many arguments that he breaks the Sabbath, that he eats with unclean hands, that he does not observe feast, observe the fast, and etc. And he claims to be the Messiah, the prophet, and many accusations that he claim to destroy the temple. So many arguments are brought against Jesus. But Caiaphas at the end, that's how Sephirely brings him, appoints him, stands up and says, Brethren, whatever you said is true, but you have not got the point. Maybe he claimed to be a Messiah or not. Maybe he has broken one law or the other. But what is important, the center is this, that this man claims to be the son of God, equal to God. And that is the center of the accusation. And that's what Jesus did. And that is what he was condemned for. So on the religious sphere, Jesus' relation to God, claiming to be equal to God, was the root cause of the verdict. And together with this, we have to see also how Jesus related himself to the leaders. He was not subservient to the religious leaders. Of course, he was not an enemy, but he was somehow exposing the hypocrisy of the religious leaders. And the scribes and the Pharisees were the greatest opponents of Jesus. Many of the parables he spoke, he addressed to the crowd, was concerning the Pharisees and their hypocrisy. Only just one example, chapter 18 of the Gospel of Luke. Jesus, while teaching about the need and how to, Pray, he brings in an example. Chapter 18, verses 9 and following. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like the other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector standing far off would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. So this self-exaltation is considered as a hypocrisy and Jesus exposed this hypocrisy with vehemently. And this brought in into direct collision with the leadership and argumentation. And this has become a violent conflict. For example, in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, we have a conflict 
between the religious leaders and Jesus. That comes to a head where Jesus accuses them being the sons of devil. John chapter 8 verses 44 and 45. You are from your father, the devil, and you choose to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks according to his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. That's how Jesus addresses the leaders, sons of Satan. That's a very, very harsh word. And similar conflict is reported in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 23. Chapter 23 is a direct attack confrontation with the religious leadership. And here Jesus is accusing them of hypocrisy and many other sins. Chapter 23 starts like this. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Therefore do whatever they teach you and follow, but do not do as they do, for they do not practice what they teach. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on the shoulders of others, but they themselves are unwilling to lift a finger to move them. And he goes on with this infective seven times, addressing a woe. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, repeats again and again, seven times. It's not a curse, it's a lament. A lament on a group of people who consider themselves as holy and saintly, but in reality, they are far away from God. How unfortunate, how unhappy your situation is, Jesus was telling. And when we go down in verse 25, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, you clean the outside of the cup and plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-intelligence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup so that outside also may become clean. The blind Pharisee. In 27, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside look beautiful, but inside they are full of the bones of the dead and all kinds of filth. Fill up then the measures of your ancestors. You snakes, you brood of vipers, how can you escape being sentenced to hell? So this is the sample of Jesus' relation to the leadership at the end. He came to proclaim the good news of salvation, the good news of God's forgiving, unconditional love. But then this was not accepted. And the leaders were mostly responsible for this. So the religious stance of Jesus brings to a confrontation, a conflict, and that seals the death sentence by the Sanhedrin. And let us conclude with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for coming down to us in your Son, as our dear Father, as our Abba, allowing us to come near you, calling you Father, and experiencing your love your forgiving love, your unconditional acceptance of everybody. Father, we thank you for sending your son to teach this. Enable us to beware of hypocrisy, condemning others, and boasting of our own righteousness. We are sinners, and we have failed to do your will very, very often. But still, you forgive us, and you continue to love us, and your love knows no end. Thank you, Father, for this unending unconditional, forgiving love that you have manifested through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.